I'd like to welcome our guests tonight, Walter Jacobson, right? a well-known anchor, commentator, reporter. Mr. Jacobson has won numerous awards for his hard-hitting news reports and hard-hitting and objective news reports. And the um, main event, Karen Lewis. Um, I first met Karen when she was running for president of the Chicago Teachers Union. I invited her to come to our school here in the 19th Ward. We were impressed by her intelligence, her energy, her integrity, her honesty, and her commitment to the kids of Chicago and the working families of Chicago. Um, the rest is history. She won the election. She led us through an historic strike. Right? And she continues to be an inspiration to working families and union members in this city and across the country. Welcome, Mr. Jacobson and Karen Lewis. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for uh, such a nice welcome. Thank you for inviting me to do this. Every reporter in town wants nothing more than to get a chance at uh, Karen Lewis these days. <laughs> to smack her with the big question, which is the one we probably ought to begin with and, and get into the less sexy stuff as we go on. But uh, I'll, I'll begin. Well, let, let me say first parenthetically that uh, if you're going to do anything in politics in this town, if you're going to be in any way involved, you've got to have some connection to the 19th, right? I mean, that's, that's where it is. I think in the last election, you turned out more voters than any other ward in the city. You've got more diversity. I mean, the 19th, Beverly and Morgan Park are just the best, right? Mm -hmm. So, I'm not surprised then that uh, Karen Lewis has decided to come here in one of her first listening sessions to find out what it is that you really want to know about the schools as well as the politics. I'm a political reporter, not an education reporter, so I will begin with a political question, which is, when will you decide? Um, so this is my third listening tour. I've been in Logan Square. I've been in North Lawndale. And I want to say, full disclosure, when I moved back to Chicago in 1983, I lived in the 19th Ward. So people, a lot of people don't know that, that I, um, my father lived on 95th and Seeley, and I lived with him and my sister. My sister still lives there. So um, my sister-in-law is also a 19th Ward resident, so I have ties to the 19th Ward. So people should know that first. Uh, that's all very good, but you didn't answer the question. <laughs> OK, I'm getting to that. Um, and can I just say special thanks to the members of the 19th Ward Committee that actually put this together. I am so proud. Because I'm going to read their names, by the way. Uh, Jim Archambault, you hear? Stan, please. Tom Brady, I know I saw Tom. We go way back. Bob Cahill, Sharon Callahan. Michelle Carberry, Mike Doyle, Maura Hall, Sarah Loftus, we go way back, Regina O'Connor, Ann O'Shea. But we call her Reggie, you know, so. Lisa Patara McGrain, Don Ruff, and Brian Sullivan and I go way back. So I'd like, first of all, thank you and talk about this is how we do things. It comes from the membership up. It bubbles up from the rank and file. This is what we've been talking about. So when will I decide? I will decide when I have certain things in place. OK? And those things are primarily the three things you need to run a campaign. You do, you've got to have money, you've got to have people, and you've got to have time. So I want to run things on my timeline. 
um, quite frankly, we're focused on the 14 elections right now. I mean, you know, things come in stages. And I think people want to hear immediately, but I will tell you the big news of the day is I did file my D1 in order for us to comply with campaign finance laws in Illinois because people are sending me money. Tell me what the strategy is in waiting. I mean, you've got to have 12,500 signatures on petitions mm -hmm. and file them mm -hmm. the end of November. Mm -hmm. And here at coming the end of the end of August mm -hmm. is when you'll have to begin to well, see. Well, we're going to actually circulate petitions. It's important. I need to see whether we can get petitions circulated, whether people really want this campaign or not. I mean, this the, the decision is going to be based on what the people want. And if they want, they will sign um, and they will sign petitions and say, "We want Karen Lewis to run." That all is extraordinarily important. That will make a big difference. So that's what I'm looking to see. What will, ha what will have to fall in line, uh, Ms. Lewis? What will you need? Give me an idea of how much money you think you'll need, how you can, how you can possibly contest Rahm Emanuel's $8 million war chest. Oh. How much money do you need? You know, I'm going to tell you right now that $8 million war chest is going to go way up, right? Yes, it is. So we can never compete with him with money. The good news is the majority of people that have the money that will be donating to him won't be able to vote because they won't live here. <laughs> okay. But that's insignificant mm -hmm. if you compare it to what he can do with his money that right. you will need some money to combat. Yeah. You mean he'll, he'll be on every television station yeah. 15 hours right. a day telling and everybody what? how and telling lies and trying. He's got to run on his record. The people of Chicago know who he is. I mean, and they've spoken about that. And he hasn't been able to move his numbers for a very long time, no matter what stunt he's pulling this week or next week. People realize that what he is doing is is just to get ready for the election. I don't think anybody is buying his shtick, quite frankly. I mean, I'm not seeing that. I mean, it's kind of annoying in a way to go places and hear people complain about this guy. You know, and it's, it's absolutely, and, I, and again, I'm going to tell people, I actually have some empathy for him. Um, and people don't realize that. People always say that we hate each other. I don't hate him. Um, I don't. But you think he hates you? Oh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yes, probably, because that's his shtick. Um, but what I do know is that your record of closing mental health clinics almost immediately uh, closing down police stations almost immediately um, and a cl cl disbanding the gang tact, you know, the gang units. If you look at the graffiti, just at the graffiti, these are quality of life issues. The amount of graffiti in this city, and I don't care where you go, has just skyrocketed. Because now we only have one paint unit. We used to have eight, I believe. So we cut those out. He just announced yesterday that he's going to cut the time back in removing graffiti from an average of, uh, I think, six days to four. Sound guy. That's not Walter. That's sound. Yeah. Your mic went out. We were talking about how much he may hate you and why. And we're talking about how he can use the fortune that he's going to gather to, to put pictures on billboards and on television. And, you know, if he gets more nervous about your possible candidacy, then he will get into more negative campaigning, mm -hmm. which means that you will be portrayed in a very negative way, which will be hard for you to combat. Well, not that the facts really don't have a lot to do with it. Yes, but I think the people of Chicago are not stupid. See, I'm not like Rahm Emanuel. Rahm Emanuel thinks Chicagoans aren't very bright. 
He's very clear that he can just bamboozle everyone into thinking that what he's doing is really good for them. You know, he can come out like, I made tough choices. I've done this. I've done that. Yeah, you know. So, so okay, I expect the worst. Why would he change now? Would you, you know? concede that he has done some good for the city? Ninety percent of the people despise the red light cameras. I, you know what, Walter? I have not done that kind of research, as a matter of fact, and I, I just. Nothing comes to mind, and that ought to say something, that nothing immediately comes to mind. You know, I talk to people on the street. I speak to rank-and-file cops and firefighters who tell me all kinds of things. And, and what I hear, and even among our own members, what we have is a demoralized city workforce that doesn't feel appreciated. <laughs> It's a huge problem. And what we also see is a person who feels intrinsically as an outsider that doesn't really appreciate what the city is about. So when you come in and we say, oh, we're going to make Chicago a world-class city, did you bother to ask us if that was something we wanted? You know, we are a city of neighborhoods. We are a city of parishes. We are a city of people identify themselves by very, very small groups, and then we build out. I mean, I think the problem is that not understanding that and not knowing that makes you not feel like you understand Chicago. And then you bring in all these people from outside of the city to head up departments, and they have no institutional knowledge. They have no understanding of how we operate. So, so what I see by and large is someone who is very tone deaf to the very people he's supposed to appeal to. And so how do you continue to put you know, stuff on. So what are you going to do? Put pictures of me saying silly stuff and scaring people. You know, but the fact is, I'm going to go to 77 neighborhoods because I respect our neighborhoods before the election, and people will get an opportunity to see me for real as opposed to just the sound bites. Okay. Well, pardon my uh, repertorial skepticism, but, you know, you'd have to tell me and the crowd here, what, what kinds of people he's been putting in what kinds of positions that you say are totally unqualified just because they don't happen to be from Chicago? I'm not saying people are unqualified. What I'm saying is that if you're not from Chicago, there are things you're not going to know about Chicago. And if you continue to cut out layers of city departments and stock them with people who are not from Chicago, then you lose a lot of institutional knowledge. So for sure, CPS looks like that, you know? How do you tell lifelong teachers that they can't be principals, they can't be district supervisors, is what they used to call them. You know how, old I, how long ago I started teaching. Um, but now, what do they call them? Network chiefs. They change the name, you know, E-I-E-I-O's, <laughs> cows. I mean, and they hire consultants to tell them how to change the names of something, right? So they can't be district superintendents. They can't be, you know, you can't move up the ladder anymore because you're going to bring somebody in. He's brought two people from out of town um, to, to be the CEO. So I think that's problematic. Um, the superintendent of police is not from Chicago. If you, if you ran for mayor and won, would you keep uh, Barbara Bird Bennett as the CEO of public schools? You know, I'm going to have a 
large group of people helping me pick the next. I would like to change the title. I'm getting rid of the title. I tell you what, if I have an opportunity, I will totally get rid of the title CEO and call it what it is. It should be a superintendent, a general superintendent. Um, I will be working very hard to get an elected representative school board. I sure and remember the days when we did have an elected school board, and it was and became increasingly, as it was sitting, political until the media and the government decided enough politics in the school board, let's not make it elected anymore. Yeah, but we didn't have a completely elected school board ever. There's never been one. There's always been appointed people on the school board, Walter. So that we had a hybrid at one time, but we never had a completely elected school board in the city of Chicago. I remember Marge Wild and her political speeches. Were you around at that time? Mm -mm. Way back? Oh, well, there was a time before you. I was probably like a little kid in school. Kindergarten. <laughs> How about this, uh, in order to affect some of these changes that you think are necessary, you have to have an idea of what to do with the problem mm -hmm. of not enough revenue. Mm -hmm. I think we have to give this to Rahm Emanuel, mm -hmm. that he's got one hell of an awful crisis when it comes to money. He mm -hmm. owes $600 million in pensions by the end of next year. Mm -hmm. How would you find enough money mm -hmm. to do what you think needs to be done? Well, I think we need to be very creative about revenue. And I think the problem is that we have had no discussions about anything except for raising property taxes or slashing city services. That has been the discussion, plain and simple. We have actually said we ought to look at a financial transaction tax. We ought to look at uh, possibly even a commuter tax. We have to look at a variety of ways to do things but what we've seen are very regressive instead of progressive taxing things happen. So like the red light cameras, it doesn't matter what your income is. If you get caught in a red light camera, you're taxed. That's a huge tax. And for some people, that means the ability to get to work or not. I mean, there are things that people do where they haven't put policy in place. And I do think that Finances are a challenge. Nobody is going to disagree with that. But we have to have a lot more people at the table than the people that say, let's just slash services and raise property taxes, because that is unsustainable. And I think there's so many interesting professors of economics that are putting things out. I'm reading Paul Krugman, I'm reading uh, I just got a, an email from a professor at UIC that says wants to help me work on this. So I mean, the, the issue is that there are people here that have other ideas that are actually willing to work. But I also think what's important is think about what happened when in the old days when the city budget would come out, we would have budget hearings in every kind of neighborhood. There would be people sitting there, they might get yelled at, but immediately with this mayor, those stopped. So we don't have a participatory budget process. We don't have a participatory democracy. I really believe in democracy. And I know that's hard for most people now because all they care about, all they care about is some top-down autocratic person that's, that appears to be tough. Well, these are campaign speech, stump speech rhetoric but you're too general. Mm -hmm. You need at some point to be more specific. Take yes, like issue. when I announced that I'm going to be well, a candidate, be maybe by then we can have this conversation. But in order to announce, don't you have to tell people some specific things that you would do to change? Like, let's take the But take I want to hear what they have to say first. Okay. Great. Because to me, what's really important is to hear from the people about what it is they want, because those are the people whose decisions that we make are going to have to live through them. I don't believe people told the manual administration that we should close down mental health clinics, or that we should change library hours, or that we should close 50 schools, 
or that we should turn around schools and give them over to their private privatization schemes. I don't think people throughout the city asked for that, but that's what they got. How, how would you get the people to ask for it if you were a mayor? But what I'm saying is those were bad decisions. So they've got people mad with him. Ask him what his numbers are. Don't, and, and, and I'm going to tell you clearly, clearly, his decisions are driving the polls. So without having conversations with people, without connecting with people, you can't walk through, shake hands, and roll your eyes and go off because you're you know, done with them. You know, I mean, it's, it's amazing to me that the people that do the work have the best answers to, and solutions to a lot of the problems. We see this throughout other places. We certainly saw it in Japan when they started selling cars and all of a sudden our cars were no longer profitable, sustainable. I mean, we've seen that. What did they do? They talked to people on the line, on the production line. That's how they got the information. Well, how, how, would, how would you affect something like that? Would you, would you, as mayor, go to every neighborhood every week and ask the people no, what they want? No, but I mean, look, here's the thing, Walter. You see, you're making this way more complicated than it has to be. <laughs> Trying to. <laughs> because, because that's why we're doing this beforehand. That's why we're doing this, to see if this will work. Even the mayor polls, has focus groups. I don't know that he listens to them, but I am convinced that the people in this room have solid answers to a lot of these issues. But if you're not listening, then you will never hear solutions. Do you, do you think his will is ill? Do you think he's trying but failing? Do you think he just doesn't care? Do you think he's, as some people do, which I disagree with, aiming at the White House and that's all that matters to him? I don't know. He cares. Does he care? I don't, I don't know. I, I have to hope he does. I mean, I'm the eternal optimist here. So I don't, I don't subscribe ill will. I do subscribe to the fact that you have to surround yourself with really good people. I mean, I think if people understand anything about the Chicago Teachers Union, they understand that Karen Lewis did not run a strike by herself. I think people need to understand that. I would say that a lot of people in this room had a lot to do with that, right? So the successes that we've been able to have have been based on the fact that we have a very large base. We have spent time talking to our members, listening to our members, taking what they have asked for and putting it together. I don't know why this is rocket science. So what I don't understand is this notion of command and control. They stopped teaching that in the business schools. I was at a business school retreat um, at Dartmouth a few weeks ago, a few months, uh, back in June. And they don't even teach command and control anymore because it doesn't work. Command and control actually stifles innovation. It stifles the kinds of things they claim they want. If people are living in fear, how do you have the opportunity to explore and grow? You don't, because you're constantly trying to figure out how to cover your back. But Chicago is a city of, uh, what, three million people, and it's very diverse, and it certainly is politically divided. Right, it's called sampling, But you can't, Walter. huh? It's called sampling, and it's scientific, and it works. You don't have to talk to every single person, but you certainly have to acknowledge their existence. Okay? Well, my observation would be easier said than done, but God bless the one who could do that if you can. That'd be just great. What would you do with some specific things, for example? Would you knock out the red light system? Well, I, I tell you what, it certainly is worth an audit, okay? It is certainly worth an audit. I mean, the more we dig down and the more we learn about it, there, there are some things that are very disturbing, as you well know. And I think that 
we deserve so much better than what we're getting. Would, would you increase the number of police officers on the street? I absolutely would, yes. I absolutely would. I absolutely would. And I think one of the problems is by not doing that and paying overtime, what we have is tired, tired cops that are, that are asking for help. I mean, again, if you talk to police officers, I've gotten so much information over the last couple of weeks, as a matter of fact, of people coming to me and telling me about programs that have been instituted that make absolutely no sense. And yet, they're being done. And, and, and the fact that they had no input into the, the, the program, that they have put people, I mean, like, so there's this thing, they call it officer in a box where the officer doesn't arrest anybody, they just kind of sit there and there's the presence and that's supposed to deter crime and it's not working because after a while people know, oh, I can do this and nobody's gonna do anything. But if you're, gonna, if you're going to deal with the size of the police force, mm -hmm. if you need another three or 400 more police on the street, mm -hmm. where would you get the money to do that? Okay, so you, you again look at what overtime when you start calculating overtime, you can actually buy more bodies. People don't understand that. I mean, it's like, it's math. It's math. But I will tell you what a police officer told me. A camera never came down off of a pole and arrested anybody. <laughs> Which I thought was kind of funny, but you know. But, but I think that there's a way to do things gradually so you get to where you need to be. You know, I'm not going to tell you I'm going to come in and then tomorrow there are going to be 2,000 more police on the street. You know, that's clearly not doable. But there has to be a much more sustainable way to get what we want and to increase the morale. You know, but you have to have conversations with cops to actually find out what it is that will make them feel better. I mean, I've heard stories where cops have said, you know, at one point I was part of this team. We did a lot of stuff. We had intel. You know, that whole, that whole 4th of July weekend when we had 84 shootings, was it? People said, okay, that very first shooting you may not be able to stop, right? Because by the time a squad car gets there, that's too late. But those second and third retaliatory shootings, you can prevent because we have cops that have relationships with people in the neighborhood. So even if they can't stop Joe, they know Joe's mom. And they can talk to Joe's mom and say, please tell Joe not to come out here tonight. There's, there's a way to do that if you're building relationships. What these people want to do is sell us technology as if that's going to solve our problems and just say, well, we don't need human beings. That is a real problem. Uh, I, I'm noticing that these questions have uh, more to do, which is very good, really, with the education system than they do about the political system. But before we get off the politics, another one or two I'm thinking of questions would be, uh, you've been told that the American Federation of Teachers, the president of it, Guy Weingarten, says that she'll commit to you a million dollars when you decide if you do. What do, you, what do you think about that? Well, she actually told me this at the convention. Um, she told me this with the newly seated um, executive council, of which I'm a member. Um, and um, it was a very moving moment for me because it automatically changes the calculus. So um, it is extremely important to know that that money is available. Um, and I hope to raise quite a few more, but because uh, a million dollars, while it's lovely, nobody's gonna turn it down, isn't gonna be enough, clearly. To Tell me what will be enough. I don't know what, four to seven, seven to 10, 
you know, something around there. What, what would dissuade you the most for taking on this task? I mean, a mm -hmm. challenge to the mayor. I think the thing that would dissuade me the most is that if people told me, if people were to tell me, you know, you just can't do this, you can't win, and and to 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 try to do this will be more harmful than good. What does that mean? Well, I mean, there are people that know that you know this particular mayor is extremely. Um, all right, what he said. <laughs> Um, and, and if I thought I w would be doing harm, because it is my goal not to just quote unquote run for mayor. I think that's only part of the process. The part of the process is to change the political landscape. The whole process is to put into place a political infrastructure that is actually responsive to the people. And if we cannot do that, then I think this might be a giant, it might be folly. So if we, if people are serious about changing the political landscape, I think we've had enough of, we have found that trickle down just absolutely does not work. You know, we were sold this, and the people that are still in charge are continuing to push. We just have to cut taxes for the rich because, you know, we're going to make them go away. They're going to go to the Cayman Islands, and they're going to go all these horrible places, and they will leave. But if we tax them, if we bring their taxes down, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it good for everybody. But we have seen the numbers don't show that. Wages in this country have been stagnant since the 1970s. They have been stagnant. But the amount of wealth that has been drained from the bottom and pushed forward up to the top 0.0%, 0.1%, those people are doing fabulously well. And then we find out the stock market is rigged. So those of us trying to play the stock, I mean, so there's all of these things that are rigged against the little guy. The economy has been rigged for quite some time. So until we can get people to stop voting against their self-interests, because they are distracted, <laughs> they get distracted by you know, promises that fit into some other narrative, you know, they'll continue to see the results of this horrible economic policy that keeps us in, in this really strange, unsustainable cycle that we can't seem to get out of. But it can, and look at Canada, just to the north, they didn't have the housing bubble. And the only reason I know that is because, you know, you watch HGTV and Property <laughs> Brothers. And Let's get back to uh, one or two of the practicalities involved mm -hmm. in this question. And, and that would be, and this is, this is a hard one for you, I would imagine. Maybe not. Nothing seems too hard for you. We sure will talk. I have good education, Walter, that I got in the Chicago Public Schools. <laughs> Early on, early on you said, quote, my expertise is far too narrow for a job like this. I understand education, but I don't know anything about garbage collecting grids. Do you still think, this was only a couple of months ago, do you still think your experience is too narrow for the job? No, I'm a quick study, and I've been studying. That's what teachers do. Look, Walter, I am a lifelong learner, OK? I don't, I'll, I'll be honest, sorry librarians, I don't read a lot of novels. I am a policy geek. I've been reading about the history of housing policy in Chicago for example, this really great book by Preston Smith. 
I've been reading about things like garbage collection grids. By the way, we haven't had an audit about that, so we don't know really what's happening. But when you talk to people, they're not as happy with things as they used to be. So we don't really know, because we don't have the data. But I can read a graph. I can read a spreadsheet. And I can really do math. You know, So I'm not math phobic. And um, so what I have found is, look, I was not wanting to do this job. And I'll tell you why. Because I knew that my life would get picked apart and my husband's and you know, our family. And I thought that would be an excessive burden. But even my husband realizes this is a moment in time and we're trying to build a movement. This is not about a single election. This is not about just 2014 or 2015 or 2016 or 2018 or 2019. It's about building the foundation of a movement. So, you know, I'm, I'm from the 60s. I grew up in the 60s. Um, this is not, this was not history class for me. So I remember that process. You know, I, I saw it on TV and my, my family talked about this. this. These were dinner, dinner table conversations. So, um, is he more willing to accept you oh, as yeah. a candidate than he was some time back? Yeah, because he, he, he had said what's no. What's changed him? <laughs> he had said no. Because my husband understands history. History? He does. He understands history. And my husband said to me, I will never stand in your way. That's not the kind of man I am. <laughs> He's here. Where is my husband? Because he is a wonderful, wonderful human being. And tomorrow's his birthday, and Thursday is our anniversary. OK, I, I'm sorry for monopolizing. Let, let's take a couple of these you can't questions. Help yourself, you ready? Walter. From the audience. OK. Wait a minute. How were you able to transform the CTU in such a short period of time? Wow. Well, because it wasn't just me. Again, I surround myself with brilliant people. Um, I think people don't understand how well educated the teachers are in the city of Chicago. We have been so maligned for so long, um, and, and it's annoying. Uh, but we have amazing minds. We have brilliant minds who Think. I mean, we think, we plan. I don't think people understand that our skills as teachers um, easily transferred into running a union. Um, we knew things had to change. We knew we needed an organizing department and a research department. We knew we came in with a deficit in our budget that we had to fix, so we did a variety of things to make that happen, but mostly, there were conversations had school by school. People don't understand that the first conversations were small and got bigger and bigger and bigger. Then we had the best organizer, Rahm Emanuel, <laughs> world's best organizer. I mean, that didn't hurt. I mean, he actually helped us. So when you get on TV and you say, teachers got raises, kids got the shaft, you know, that's horrible. And parents didn't like that either. The other thing is that we have connections with our parents who are the backbone of the neighborhoods. So this wasn't about just transforming CTU. It was about transforming our communities. What? So I don't think people understand that those take person-to-person -person connections. Can you make, would you make these kinds of remarks in front of an audience of the business elite? If they ask me, I'd be glad to if tell they them. They ask you to come. And if they, they ask me those questions, I'd be glad to tell them. They're, look, as my father used to say, who lived on 95th and Sealy, may he rest in peace, my father used to say, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Right? Right. I don't say that the business people are wrong. I just say they have one way of looking at things. 
if what you do over and over again is causing more harm than good, then you need to re-examine that. We call that reflection in education, <laughs> right? How, how? So, but what I would say to them, the things that you are doing that are good, we want to be a part of that process. Nobody is all wrong or all bad and all good. This is whole notion of how we come together and we use our strengths. That everybody has certain skills. So what you do is you focus on the skill sets that the people have and the deficits. We, we like to focus on deficits. That is why we cannot find our way out of holes because we're focusing on deficit. Instead of focusing on what people do well and bringing that to the table, you combine that, then you have positive energy that you have never seen before to solve problems. Do you ever think that uh, if, if you became mayor that you would be depriving the CTU of the kind of leadership that yes. you have? What yes. do you think about sure. that? Sure. But we have worked at making different layers of leadership. We have been very inclusive in our process. And, and, and more people have been involved in the CTU than ever in the history of CTU. That is why CTU has changed, has transformed. Well, certainly your election proved some of that. Now let me go on to another question from the audience. If elected mayor of the city of Chicago, assuming you will run, what would be your first priority? Well, my first priority is to bring together the people that can solve the problems. We have to look at, I think, we have to focus in with laser-like focus instead of I'm going to do this today and that tomorrow and blah, blah, blah. We have to look at a sustainable way to fund our schools equitably. We have to look at a way to deal with crime and policing. We have to look at a way to deal with housing issues. And we have to look at a way of developing our neighborhoods so that people want to live there. So that, you know, people want to t talk about things. I'm a little annoyed that our property values aren't back to where they need to be. When you look across the country, Property values are on the rise again. Ours are kind of like bumping up, and in some neighborhoods they're okay, but in other neighbor, in my neighborhood, you know, I'm underwater on my mortgage. You know, my house is worth less than half for what I paid for it, my condo. So, so the issue is, in my neighborhood, and I want to make it for the record. I live in Oakland. People put in the newspaper that I live in Kenwood. I don't. The president of the United States has a house in Kenwood. I live further north because there's, you know, Kenwood, then there's North Kenwood, and then there's Oakland. I live in Oakland. And I would like to see, I do not understand why on Cottage Grove from 39th on down to 47, we don't have amazing restaurants and really cool boutiques. You know, those are things that change the face of the neighborhood when we have a very interesting mix of people that are living in that neighborhood. So, the development, the developmental possibilities are there. We just have to start pushing that. And the key is we are looking at addition, not subtraction. The more people invest in our communities, the better off Chicago is. Okay, next. We all know Ron Emanuel's solution to academically struggling schools is to close them, <laughs> fire all the staff, and then turn them around. What would you do differently to help those schools? Okay, so first of all, I think we need to start thinking very differently about what academic success is. Right now, we are in, in this entire country is for some reason ridiculously, slavishly devoted to test scores. And what we have to start looking at, and this, I mean, the research is there. The Chicago Consortium on School Research has shown that schools do so much better when all of these other things are in place. 
when the faculty feel empowered and feel part of the decision making process, when parents and community are engaged in the schools. And I think that we have to have a very different view of what a school is. It has to be an anchor of the community. It ha I mean, they were talking about the longer school day. I think schools should be open until 8 and 9 o'clock at night so that the community can have an opportunity to utilize those schools. So I don't think people have understood that there are ways to make schools much more efficient than they are without taking the joy out of teaching and learning. All of which will take a huge amount of work. How can you run for mayor and run the teachers union at the same time? Well, you know, first of all, um, again, you know, you all think that I'm like wave a magic wand and everything gets done, right? And that I do every single thing by myself at the teachers union. The teachers union is a group of folks working together and quite frankly the teachers union is not the people that work at the merchandise mart the teachers union is all the people in all the schools across the city i think people don't understand that so and i don't run you do i come and tell you what to do i don't even do that i mean it's not how that works so i think the problem that people have is once i make my decision I will see what I need to do and how best to handle that. And I'm going to ask my members what they think about that too. And I'm sure they'll give me some good advice. How much do you want in your heart to run for mayor? It's a good question, Walter. It's a very good question. I am so seriously considering this. Before I was just thinking about it. Now I'm seriously considering it. When, but I'll have a number for you. When, when was that development, that transition? When did you go and why from thinking about it to seriously considering it? What I have done is had some conversations with a variety of people across the city and ask their opinions. What do you think about this? You know, what do you think? And I have listened to what they've said. And what they've said to me is that we believe you're a consensus builder. We believe you have the ability to do this. And I mean, that's very heady talk, right? And especially from people that I respect, that I respect politically, that I respect financially, that I respect um, on, on a research basis. So, um, and people have, and then again, I mean, you know, I am so not a private person anymore that when I walk down the street, people come to me and talk to me all the time. And I gotta tell you, I feel a lot of love out in the city. Please, uh, the people you've been talking to, I know you're not going to give me names. Yeah, but that's not gonna happen. No, but, <laughs> but, but are they leaders of commerce and business and education, or are these people from the union or people you meet on the street? Who are they? All of the above. All of the above. All of the above. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, avoid another. Okay, for the record, how cute is Walter? <laughs> Seriously. Hey. I, I was looking at a question. What did you say for the record? Nothing. No, I just said for the record, how cute is Walter? Oh. Can't soften me up. Too late. I'm too old, huh? Too late. Avoid uh, two concerns for success. One. Avoid another council wars by getting new progressive alder persons who will support Mayor Lewis to improve the whole city. That's too easy. Elected school board. Oh, you've already talked about that. Yeah, that's pretty easy, too. What would you like to, me to ask you? Walter, let me tell you what. If you hadn't done your homework, you know, you're, you're not getting any help from me on this one. <laughs> what you will get is a detention or two. You were supposed to do your homework. You and I did not sit down and say what you were going to ask me. 
So I'm expecting you to do all the hard work. Oh, well, see, you get around. You can get around every question because you're yeah, you're just so articulate. That was a very that was a very fair question. I'd like to know what I forgot what the question was. <laughs> what was that question? Uh, that you said I wasn't prepared. I thought I did pretty much homework. All right, I'll so get back to So all those are too easy? Is that what the problem is? Pardon me? Those are all too easy? Well, they're all from, they're mostly from people in the teachers union. So the, I'm looking for one that would be tough. No, you don't want me to ask her a tough one? Uh. Oh my. How can you better support Chicago's public servants? and resist privatization and maintain. I think that's extremely important. First of all, our experience with privatization has been that our services have decreased, but we're paying more for them. It doesn't work. Privatization is the biggest scam that's ever been run on anyone. So actually, it ends up being cheaper to support public services because those dollars get turned around in our city. The issue is how do we keep money in the city floating through the neighborhoods over and over and over again so that when I get paid, I go to the grocery store in my neighborhood. You know, I can even shop in my neighborhood if I choose to for clothes and shoes and I don't have to go to big box stores, I don't have to do this. So then those people turn that money over and over and over again. The issue is that your city services get better. I mean, what, can I just complain about the potholes for a minute? I don't ever recall the potholes being as bad as they are now. I don't ever recall the roads being as horrible as they are now. So what would you do and, about and what I, And there's a reason for that, because the streets and sand folks don't live in the city anymore, right? What's happened is the people that are coming in and filling those, those holes are suburban outfits. They've been, they've been, they are not regular streets and sand workers. Streets and sand workers that live on the block know when the potholes are. They would take care of that immediately. There was a time where they would even come to your house and ask you what's going on. Is everything cool? They would talk to. So again, the fact that we have lost people that are committed to living in this city, making this city work, under the guise of we can't afford them. The issue is that we are taking those funds and giving them somewhere else, but we are getting less of the service than we used to have. And what does the leadership of the city, the government, have to do with changing those things? I mean, these well, are wonderful all, ideas. You, but, but first of all, you have to have the metrics, right? These people talk about data. You have to have the data so you can look and say, you know what? We're spending money over here. These guys are not doing a good job. We're going to bring it back in the city. We can move money around. But money is fungible. We all know that. It's not stuck in a pot somewhere and said so we can't touch it. Well, of course, but money you have to know. Money is fungible. But you we can start hitting up those it. tiffs. Now, come on. Tiffs. <laughs> tiffs were designed to be used for development in blighted areas. I just do not know how, you know, downtown is blighted. Not, not in Chicago, but TIF money is being used there. We are constantly having to beg big business to come and do work, and we have to promise them all this stuff, and yet they get all the rewards. When do we ask them to be good citizens, too? We all have to be good citizens. We all have to do our share. So it is important for us to hold everybody accountable, not just the little guy, not hold everybody accountable. This is doable, again, by building relationships and saying, look, this will work. And you will not lose. Once again, this is about addition, 
not subtraction. Give me a couple, I just thought of this. Give me a, a couple of names of your heroes in history, in government. I mean, recently. Like, who do you really think is doing a wonderful job and is an elected official? You know, Walter, that is so unfair because, unfair? first of all, I, I mean, you said the word hero, and I don't, I don't use that word lightly. Right. I think there are people that are competent, and I think there are people that are doing the best they can with what they have. But I think that our society has changed in such a way, and money is such a part of politics now, that it is very difficult for people who I believe have good hearts and good natures to be able to really put forth the kinds of legislation that w will actually help most everyday people, okay? And I think that's a problem. But I don't have political heroes. Um, my heroes come from the movement. Um, and. And quite frankly, my biggest heroes are some of my former teachers who, who pushed me, who pushed me to be so much better. I mean, my, um, I gotta tell you, can I tell you about my favorite teacher? All right, she's 93 years old and still drives. <laughs> Scary though. And, and she lives in South Dakota. She was my, um, Algebra trig and college algebra and analytic geometry teacher. I had her for two classes. And this woman completely changed my life because she empowered me to not be afraid of math and to see how math had patterns that not just opened you uh, up to do problem solving, but that actually gave me a life lesson, you know? So, so her name is Dorothy. It was Dorothy Lavington. She taught at Kenwood. Any Broncos in the room? Bronco love. All right, there's a couple. <laughs> Bronco love. Um, and, and, um, and, and she just was amazing. So um, I went to visit her at Thanksgiving. And my husband and I went up uh, to South Dakota. And she drove us around and took us places. And, um, <laughs> But this is a woman that still does Sudoku and crossword puzzles and reads the Bible every single day and still has this huge capacity to make relationships with people regardless of race, creed, color, religion. She took us to a Hutterite colony. And um, it, I mean, just, just this wonderful person who just pushed me Without um, being stern or stuff, she always had a beautiful smile on her face. And she made learning just exciting, right? And she just made me feel really smart, you yes. know? So I think those are my heroes. The people that, you know, have been in my life to mentor me, those are my heroes. Because that's what we need more of. I mean, and they all give you confidence. You would, one last one. Would you, um, would you expect if you enter this race that race and gender will be issues? Yeah, because this is America, Walter. <laughs> we, certain things haven't changed. I mean, there are people that don't believe women can run cities or countries or anything. There are people that genuinely believe that. You know, and I think that's unfortunate, but I'm not going to that I'm not going to have that battle. But of course, of course these things happen. What have I missed? <laughs> what would somebody like to add? What's your plan for charter schools? Plan for charter schools. So, you know, I don't believe in closing schools, but we don't have to open a whole lot more, right? Let's do the real studies. Let's see what they're doing. The whole purpose of charter schools, people don't realize this, they were started by union teachers. They were absolutely started by union teachers and they wanted to get some of the district mandates off their, um, off their backs. And they said, 
give us the toughest kids and we'll be able to work with them and give them what they need. Give us that opportunity. And that's how the charter movement actually started. Now, it was unfortunately co-opted by the voucher movement because the voucher movement went nowhere. Because people, by and large, do not like the idea of vouchers. Um, they're very unpopular in most places. So, but the voucher movement, people say, well, we can use charter law to do what we couldn't do before. For me, the problem with charter schools is not the teachers in the charter schools or the kids or the parents who choose that. It is the people who see charter schools as a way to make money off of our children. It is the people who see it as a business, who I was a principal at a charter school, so now I open up a business selling computers to the charter school, and I open up another business over here, and I'm selling textbooks to the charter school. These are the things that bother me, because that, as far as I'm concerned, is just a license to steal. It is unregulated in a way that is, is not, it doesn't help children. Then when you look at their so-called results, you see that they do no better, by and large, than traditional public schools. However, I wouldn't go and say, oh, I'm going to close all the charter schools, because I, I think closing schools is traumatic. It is traumatic. And I think that if you can do other things other than close them, it's so much better. And I think there are other alternatives. OK. Do you think Rom's afraid of you? I, 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 <laughs> I, I think Rom just wants his life to be easy. And you'd make it hard. I'm not trying to make it easy for him, no. I'm not going to ever say that, no. Have you got an idea who might run if you don't want to? No, I haven't thought about that right now. So if you don't do it, as far as you know now, as far as any of us really know, is he'll just have a free ride. It could happen. It could happen. Have you had any discussions like that? Well, I think that would be really bad for the city of Chicago. So, um, you know, I think that would be unfortunate. Okay. That's a um, Jackie, I don't know. You know, I would look and see what is best for our children. I mean, I also think we can just, you know, fold in some of the schools back into our fold. I mean, that's one of the things we could do. I mean, but I think that, um, I think that the community needs to decide what's being done. And I think that if the community comes together and makes those decisions, then I think we need to listen to that. I think that's the hardest part of this process was watching the communities um, please go unheard. And there's something devastating about that. And I don't think I will ever, as long as I live, forget the pleading, the crying, the begging for our schools and for that to fall on deaf ears. I don't think I'll ever forget that. Your contract's up in, contract's up in, June. in June. Do you think we may be heading for a, another strike? You know. <laughs> That, again, was left up to the membership, you know, and I, I, I'll be honest with you, I was stunned. I didn't think the membership wanted to go out on strike. People kept asking me, are going to strike? You know, I'm like, what are you talking about? We haven't had a strike in 25 years. But again, the bubbling up of discontent and, and um, was a problem. So I don't know. Um, and again, we're, matter of fact, tonight there's a PPC meeting, uh, Professional Problems Committee, and they are the ones that start the work on the contract. 
And when school opens, there will be contract committees in each school, and they'll be working on that. So those of you that are here, I'm hoping you volunteer to work on your contract committees. Those are extremely important because that's when we get the ideas about what members want, what they know is working in our new contract, what they know is not working in our new contract. And I think that's so important and invigorating. Okay. Karen Lewis, thank you very much, and my best to you either way. Thank you. But I do have to say... Leave it at that. I, I, I would say I'd end it by saying that I'd like to see you run. The media would like to see you run. But that's not because, that's not because we believe you ought to be, but it would be so valuable to the community to have a debate on the issues here. Sure. Thank you. What a conversation. What a crowd. Thank you all for coming um, to tonight's event. Um, conversing with Karen and Walter was uh, certainly a treat for us all. Um, I want to thank you for the time that you spent here with us, um, providing good questions, um, providing some great momentum for Karen, pushing the envelope with the questions. Um, letting your voice be heard. Karen is on a tour of 77 neighborhoods to understand exactly what this community, these communities of Chicago need. And with that, she also needs your continued activism and your continued work. And so what does that mean? That means that you have to continue to organize. This gathering here didn't just happen. Um, no one waved a magic wand. It was organized by rank and file members um, of this community who wanted to have this conversation. This is necessary in all 77 neighborhoods. This is also very necessary to register new voters. This is also very necessary to preserve public accommodation, publicly funded public schools. The soul of our city depends on the people who sit here tonight and the people who sit in the other 77 neighborhoods. Karen is one very valuable, strong, wonderful voice. But as a choir, we make her stronger and we make our city stronger. Again, leave here tonight with a renewed sense of energy to do the work, to lift your voice in opposition to what we see as failed policy, but to also bring along your family to bring along your neighbors, and to bring along those who have not registered yet. Thank you again for spending your night with us. Have a great evening.